but I mean, the JavaScript was very powerful. <laughs> uh, but but it, it was amazing how you could get clever and do a real lot with a real little. That is the, the entire uh, algorithm. Um, and then this, the brain was the next enemy, um, and kind of he, um, I guess, is the, the second enemy that could kill um, humans. The Hulk could crush them to death. Uh, the brain actually would reprogram them and turn them into enemies known as progs, and kind of like the mutant, really, from Defender. Um, so the um, that was the brain, and we had the cool like bulging veins and heads and stuff. And, and it was cool because every fifth wave is the bonus round. I mean, that was your opportunity with all the mommies or daddies or Mikeys. Um, and but it wasn't a given that you were going to do well or, or get a big bonus. Some brain waves didn't go well, and, and a lot of them, uh, with your skill, were amazing. Yeah, risk reward. And the um, their projectile was known as the cruise missile, um, which was a uh, kind of a randomly seeking. Um, Projectile which actively seeked you, um, and with certain randomness, and a very um, pesky kind of kind of thing. But again, very different, totally different algorithm. Um, the interesting thing was the Mikey. What's known as the Mikey bug. The, are you guys familiar with that? The Mikey. Okay. Okay. Um, this was a bug that uh, was uh, actually I, we didn't discover this for like four or five years. Um, I th I'm sure some player, you know, probably discovered it on the second day. But being the developers, we we didn't make it. But the whole idea is, if you kept Mikey alive on the first brainwave, then they wouldn't eat any other humans, and you could get like this massive bonus. And, and actually, every brainwave there is a one of the humans is kind of a Mikey. And if you can tell what, who they're seeking for, and if you can protect that person, then you can keep all the humans alive and get massive bonuses. And so this was like late what in the game. Thing. This was late in the game, and uh, we were having a lot of fun with the game. And there's always uh, you don't know when to stop. You know, you, you just don't know when to stop. And we, we work with a lot of the most creative people and best designers, and almost universally, the greatest of the great designers are terribly insecure. And so part of what makes their stuff great is that they three ratchets after it's great they keep going. And, uh, yeah, that was kind of the, um, you know, we, we were having an amazing amount of fun with the game, and for some reason there was this negative thing, like, we need one more thing, you know, like, you know and, uh, you know, we had to, you know, freaking Tempest is still making a lot of money. We've got to have that final death blow, and, uh, I mean, you can only, you know, we can't go around the country destroying all the power supplies, so. Um, so the, uh, and this was kind of, I guess, uh, in some ways, a, uh, a brainchild of, uh, of Larry. Um, and this was the tanks, which uh, the idea was that you have to create another enemy that's like completely different from all the others. And uh, although yeah, the spawning was similar to the enforcer with the, a cork would spawn the tanks. And but the, uh, the interesting thing about the tanks is they, unlike all the other projectiles in the game, it had um, uh, bank shots. It was kind of like playing pool, you know, kind of playing pool with the player. And it was just, uh, you know, obviously you guys, uh, anybody who has played Robotron, this is like the most horrific uh, enemy out there because it's just, the style of play is so different and... The, the tanks ruin many a good game. You get your men racked up, you've got six, seven, eight, ten men, and you're cruising along and you hit a seven or a twelve or a seventeen. And it's a uh, sad day sometimes. Yeah, and for some reason there's there's some really bad code in there. And sometimes they'll just all shoot at once at you for like you know, about ten shots and just like that. And I assume yeah. people know about the tank shot bug where they run out of shots. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 uh, there's a missing decrement station statement to decrement the shots in existence when they die, so. Um, it's keeping track that there's never more than 20, and so after the 20th bullet, after he dives the 20th bullet, they just run around stupid. Uh, <laughs> here's this enemy. And so, I mean, sometimes, you know, when you, when you dodge the firestorm, there's probably just two or three bullets left that you go, okay, we can do it, we can do it. Yeah, that's another interesting point. 
So I just need an AI <laughs> at, uh, Consider the tools of the tech. Right. This was pre uh, pre Siri. Um, and, and, and it was really it was really a signature really of all the work in games. The Japanese games were really mostly predictable and scripted, and we set up all the scenarios randomly with lots of randomness. Um, and you know, I, I Ryan, are you back from Pokemon? No, still not here. He, he was here in between. I saw. Him. Um, but there's a new uh, Pokemon gym. I think the blue team just took it over. A, down the hall. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, yeah. he tells me the game's unfair. It's unfair. And, you know, sometimes the randomness gives you happiness and sometimes it gives you really tough. But um, as we have learned and we'll see, there are people that can that have conquered this game despite all the adversity that, that we are just amazed by. As a matter of fact, David Gomez. Um, stand up. Yeah. This is, uh, come on, David. <laughs> this is David Gomez. <laughs> if, um, Dave, if, Dave, we're going to get to David if we don't run out of time. Um, but he is the master of all Robotron of all time. Um, and, and, and it's amazing. And there are... And there are hours and hours of it on Twitch if you want to watch it. I mean, I mean there may be some people in this room that, that uh, don't agree with that very and, 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 um, and I, 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 it's a challenge. It's a challenge. I, I, as a matter of fact, my money's on David and it will take all covers. But yeah, so the, the idea of artificial intelligence through random number generation, the, the really interesting thing is, is people will personify the random number. You know, they will say, like, this guy really hates me. You know, it's like, you know, and, and it's like it draws a bunch of bad random numbers in a row and it's like, you know, this game hates me, it's killing me, you know, I suck. You know, like you start having a personality crisis. And then, and then you get all these great random numbers and it's just like, oh my god, I'm great, I'm amazing, I'm, I'm, I'm a genius, I'm, you know. And, and so it's, it's, you really take this stuff personally, you know, and, and uh, so it, you really associate a lot more intelligence with this. And, uh, and you know, it's interesting, quantum mechanics, um, pretty much the, the more they look, the more it's like, you know, um, with apologies to Einstein, it's like God does play dice out there, you know? And uh, um, so it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and uh, so, yeah, a lot of the whole game is all the arrangements of the, um, the numbers of the Different entities are, are scripted for each wave, but the um, where they show up is completely random every wave, and so there's just just random number upon random number that went into Robotron. But you, you, there's a certain range of random numbers that's interesting, and so you have to kind of tweak them into that range that's interesting to a human, because I mean they could kill you in 32 microseconds. You know, um, it's not interesting. Um, so you have to create a, a velocity and a um, human kind of human uh, centered uh, range of the random numbers that feels good. It's very playable. Um, there was a lot of cool graphics uh, um, things based on the uh, this horizontal, diagonal, and vertical explosions. Um, we had this new chip that we did in the game, which was a uh, it was a, one of the earliest graphics coprocessors. And it could do some really cool um, fast memory transfers um, that were, you know, at a blazing speed of one megahertz. Um, pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> it, it moved a lot of robots. We could not have done the game without it. Yeah. 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 And, that, um, you know, and the game was, this was an era where games were done on a black background because it was too processor consuming the, to move the stuff that we had to have specialized hardware to do that. And we always got a lot further with generalized bitmap where we could do anything anyway. But we lost some of the performance that uh, some of the specialized hardware could perform. Um, so that kind of closed the book on Robotron. I found this picture. That is my mother and me playing a Robotron cocktail show at the uh, at, the AO, at the AOE show where the game was launched in 1982. 
And um, here we are about uh, 34 years later. So uh, the game looks the same, but uh, we're looking pretty good. <laughs> okay. And after Robotron, we heard Atari's coming out with their next console. And the 2600 owned the, the universe. They just they had tens of millions of these out, and game company after game company was making game after game, and the 5200 must be twice as good as the 2600. <laughs> um, and we heard again before it came out, it's going to be on a platform that is the Atari 800 computer hardware system. <coughs> And so we came up with the idea, you know, let's um, let's try and see if we can do an original new game. Is that me? Uh, well, I guess everybody in this room has that ring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the interesting thing, the arcade kind of business, the arcades were kind of dying. This is in the, the mid-80s. Yeah. And so it was like, hey, let's, let's go and do uh, home video games. They'll never die. Yeah. And uh, so, <laughs> and there, there really wasn't much in 3D. There was a Star Raiders game that Atari did for the 800 that was, you know, sort of interesting. There wasn't any gameplay there, and it was graphically kind of nice. And they, it was a big seller in the 800. And we thought if we did a 3D game in the best 3D we could do on that hardware, that uh, if it was interesting, that when the 5200 came out, we would have a winner. And we created um, the, the Game Blaster. Maybe many don't know, it was not a coin-up game. It was created for the Atari 800, uh, then go to the 5200. And, um, and that game, it, there's a complete working game for the 800. There is a, there's a coin-up version out on the floor. Yeah, the, the durable cabinet. Okay. Get there. So for 3D, um, you either use your fancy scaling hardware, or if you have an Atari 800, you you figure out how to draw things different sizes. So this is when it's far away, a little closer, a little closer, a little closer. That was the man, the help. That was one of the rocks. Um, we made these templates, and, and those are how we created those characters. And then. Um, we talked to Mike Stroll about that we were doing this. He said, oh, let me help you get it to Atari. I've got a you know, great relationship there. Um, but but put, put the cartridge on hold. Let's make this a coin out first. We'll clean up there, and then your cartridge will be even bigger because of the power of the brand. And so we did that. And we hired artists. I know. Can you believe that? I mean... What is the world coming to, you know? Um, we had uh, two guys, John Sheldrake and Ken Roberts, who, um, John actually came with us and did some of the Robotron characters. And um, then the two of them did all of the art for Blaster, which, uh, you know, we actually, you know, made that leap from drawing on graph paper to letting artists draw on graph paper. <laughs> <laughs> And um, did we, have, we had some kind of pixel program. We did. It was called Picasso. You know it. You know oh it. It, it actually ran on, a, it ran on the target system, which was really an odd. You know, we have these development computers. Um, character, they're character-based terminals. And it's, there's no VGA or CGA. It was NGA. No, it was no graphics. <laughs> um, and so to do an art program, we used the Williams Electron, you know, the Williams hardware platform. And download it like a game, an art package, and you use the joysticks on the panel to move from pixel to pixel and select your color. And, and that's uh, actually better. They did everything in it. Poor guys. <laughs> um, and then the next step in that evolution was Deluxe Paint, is what we use for video games. And then the pinball, uh, pinball domination stuff, I think, was done in Deluxe Paint. Um, so the arcade market totally bombed out and Blaster was what it was, um, but was, the, the business was dying. What was, was worse, the, the game or the market? Larry? That's just, that, we can, we can, <laughs> do, do we have another hour? Is, uh, is, we need another hour to, to debate that. This is not our best work. Um, and it's really interesting. It, it, it's, um, Moving from 2D to 3D, and it, it's sort of the, the extension of the game in three days. 
there's so many things that you have to do to make things work right in 3D that too much of our development time got spent with the technology and not nearly enough with the intriguing gameplay. But we also learned it's really hard to do something as tactically engaging as Robotron in 3D where all the enemies are, are this big because they're out in the distance. You know, you can't, you know, moving around in 3D, you can't, you can't see your enemies because they're all, they're all this big when they're not there, right about to, you know, blow up in your face. And uh, so driving games have always worked well. Um, and there have been a couple of 3Ds. Star Wars was very good. You know, Buck Rogers was interesting. Um, but it's really hard to make a game as, as challenging and interactive as the games we were making in, in Blaster. We really, we never got the gameplay to where, to where we'd love to play it. Yes, and I mean, it's super immersive, but in the kind of the God's eye 2D view, you have much more information about what's going on in the game. It's so kind of a deeper, richer game and, um, where, the, where you're in, in kind of the intensity of 3D is really cool. You get this rush, but you don't, hard, it's hard to develop the tactics and strategy uh, in that format. I forgot to ambush the crowd with my question. I'll do it after the fact. I know it's not going to work. Who's, who's, who in the audience where Blaster is your favorite game? Yeah. And I know I couldn't get anyone this way, but uh, every game on that floor, no matter how stinky a turd it is, and there are stinky turds out there, is somebody's favorite game. Okay, you will come along somewhere, like, where are you the blaster? Oh my god! <laughs> you can you say, oh, wait, I'm a blaster marquee, can, can you get inside? Um, and, and, and we've gone through that. Literally every single game, no matter what platform or what it is, is somebody's favorite game. And, and Blaster, again, we, it was not our best work, but it, it, it's, it's just that phenomenon. I love, I wish I could have ambushed you guys before we uh, went down that line. Hey, uh, um, I did that at a, at a seminar uh, last year on pinball. It was somebody's favorite game, game last year? No, it was a pinball oh, seminar. Okay. I, have a, I have a very strong feeling about certain pinball machines. <laughs> so, um, including ones that I worked on. So, the, the game was not what we would have wanted from what we envisioned, and the market totally collapsed. And the combination made it, you know, a pretty short run, not very successful for Williams, not very successful for us. And so, okay, let's put out the home game now, which was done before the coin op, and that market collapsed before the game got into that market. Um, Atari actually licensed it from us, but they never produced it. And um, I still got the chips from the original game, but I passed them a lie. I don't know if they're in any of the emulators, but... Um, they are. They are? Okay, um, so that was uh, that was kind of that kind of led to 1984. George Orwell didn't realize that would be the end of it, kids. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't 2084. It was 1984. <laughs> so, um, as we were saying, the, the markets kind of went crazy. So Eugene said, "I, I uh, want to go back to California. He loves it here. He went to Stanford around the corner." And uh, I ended up uh, taking a little time off and on a circuitous path, found, found my way into the Williams Pinball Group. And then we, like every divorce, this was like a divorce, okay, but it was not as hostile. <laughs> but there were some lively discussions about who was going to get what. As partners, we bought a lot of stuff, equipment, games, furniture and the like, and we went through that terrible process, got over the grieving, and then... <laughs> I mean, and I'm still grieving over that. I mean, the guy was going to buy everything. It was just... <laughs> and, and the scenario for that, I, I was staying in Chicago, and I had, I had a studio apartment that I uh, rented to move stuff and didn't kind of keep my development going. Eugene was fleeing in Chicago and was selling everything. And so he, he found someone to, you know, to buy all this stuff and he like, my desk. <laughs> <laughs> and Larry had said, dude, whatever you do, don't sell my desk. <laughs> um, so we get to 1986 
and Eugene's finished his master's, and he's back at Williams starting up a new video game group. I'm at Williams working on pinballs, and we look at the scariest scenario known to men on the planet. And why is this a scary scenario? When you shoot that enforcer in the upper right corner, the game's probably going to crash. Carpets. Um, and there was, a, there was a bug in Robotron from day one, and this is my bug, and it's time for me to come clean. <laughs> okay. Um, and the worst thing about the bug is that we knew about it before the game was published. We didn't know exactly what or why or were able to fix it. And we made all 20-some thousand Robotrons with this bug that in a... And it only happens when you've got 20 lives and half a million and are really cruising. Um, but, and, and good players, great players learn in those games that you don't take that shot. You don't take that shot. <laughs> another, another part of the skill. And David, am I correct in your first 100 million game, you played it with the Enforcer bug and, and, and beat it with the bug in the program, is that correct? No. I, I, got, <laughs> I, I got to 60 million and the bug got me. That, and I, I watched that, that marathon. Yeah. 60 million. Again, it was, they're doing this on Twitch and it's really cool <laughs> if you're very, 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 very aerobic. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's basically a curving problem where the, you're. It's not. Well, it's, 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 not, it's not. That's why we never saw this. I know I, this week I finally understand the problem. The re that's why we never found it, because I thought it was a clipping problem. Okay. Right. Um, the, real quickly, we're not going to do too much computer science 101, but this is a memory map, and this is address zero, and it goes down in 256, 512, whatever, and you fill all the memory with the screen, and you're out here at whatever 300 times 256 is. Um, the next byte in all of this memory is the same memory, and that's the RAM we use for our program. So we had a great situation where, you know, the player would shoot a bullet, it would travel, and if the clipping program didn't detect it going off screen and get rid of that bullet, it would travel and you'd literally be shooting your program. Sorry. <laughs> um, and so, in looking for this bug and knowing that we've shot so many programs so many times, we were certain, and I, until literally this week, decoding these bugs for this presentation, I always believe that this diagonal explosion, which is going to go this way, was going into this nice little RAM area and corrupting the program, and that's what I looked hard for in 1982 and never found. Um, and there it is. In the mix at the time, this isn't an excuse, this is just part of the decision-making process. The, it was the hardware. It was the hardware. <laughs> it wasn't the hardware. However, the um, graphics coprocessor or blitter chips were being developed. It's a, it's a long process to get all the circuits into a custom chip and mass produce it. And they create. Oops, they created these boards, which had all the circuitry that did exactly what the chips did. And they worked pretty well, and they almost ran at bus speed. And you can see they've got some little upside down chips with wires on them, big antennas. Um, so our development systems were a little flaky, and they crashed from time to time. And so, you know, okay, it's the, it's the, the boards, whatever. And then the, um, the chips came. The first prototype chips came and they had hardware problems. And then I went chasing this shooting the RAM problem and never found it. And we just didn't know. And I was blaming the hardware more than the software at the time, which I will admit. And we published the game. The first programmer ever to do that, Larry. <laughs> For, to blame the programmer or to blame the hardware or to come, or to come clean? <laughs> 
it, it only took me 34 years. Um, so, a sequence of events happen when this guy named Christian Gingras sends a letter to Williams. It's in November of, was it November of 86? And, hey, how can I find Eugene Jarvis or Larry Dumar? And, and I need, I, I, I've got some aspects of their program I want to discuss with them. And then April 12th, so this is like six months later, I don't know how long it took Williams to respond, but six months later we get a letter. Hi, I'm Christian, I'm a student. I've been studying Robotron, I've gone through every line of code, and I found some bugs. It's, it's a very long winter up in Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> and so here's bug number, mistake, mistake number one. And here, here's the detail. And mistake number two, and there's the detail. Mistake number three, and there's the detail. I guess three was a bigger mistake. <laughs> and then mistake number four, the unsolved one, is really the one that we're interested in. That's the, the diagonal explosion problem. And uh, so Eugene and I, we go get out the listings of the code, and we discover mistake number one is accurate, number two is accurate, number three is accurate. They were all bugs or things that we did wrong in the coding that you can see when you look at the logic, none of them caused any malfunction in the program, so we never knew they were there, nobody knew they were there. The game had been out for four years and, and nobody knew them, and you couldn't know about them unless you studied and learned every line of the program and saw the mistakes. Um, so we wrote Christian back, um, Here's our letter, and basically we found, yes, bug number one is right, there's the reason. Bug number two, bug number three, and he's investigating the diagonal explosion, and we said, yes, please, we wish you luck, please work on this. <laughs> <laughs> now, this was the first unpaid intern. <laughs> And we were so impressed with what he had done, we asked him to come in for a job interview at our expense, and he said fine, and he appeared. Um, I'm not, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to go through it, but this, is, this shows you, this, each one of these, this is what he wrote about the bug, this was our explanation, and this is in the code why it happened. This one, the bug is in code, it's an error condition that never gets executed. And so that's why it didn't cause a problem. Here, here is uh, <laughs> this is his listing. This is the original listing. He right ran the code through a disassembler, yeah. and I think I it looks like so, so. All of this is put up by a disassembler. This is the disassembler's best interpretation. It's interpretation of instruction by instruction, but it doesn't have all the comments, and it doesn't have nice names for the labels. It just says, you know, go to this address, and you have to look it up. Um, like here's 468, and something probably references 468. Um, so anyhow, bug one was in an error handler. It never, never was executed. Bug two is really a hideous one because um, it was a really bad coding style, where instead of using a label, the programmer said, go to star plus three. Yes, Larry. <laughs> and it should have been star plus five, but it really should have been with a label for anyone that writes software, not, not you know, it was like, hey, there's a three, three character instructions jumping over, go to star plus three, but it measures the star plus three from here. Not from there. And you know, it branches into the middle of an instruction, and when that happens, that's almost a formula for crashing. But the instruction is a subtract with carry from B from a RAM location, and B isn't used in this routine, and luckily B isn't, isn't revered by anyone that calls the routine. And so this bug also had no effect, but was totally discovered by the guy who studied every line of the program. And, and we wouldn't care that much about this until we get to the end of the story, which many of you know the, how it concludes. In the third comment, he says that you're missing a branch load of F024. Well, there's a branch load of EX whatever zero, which is indeed F024. 
um, which ended up in the comment field of the instruction before it. I hate when that happens. <laughs> and, and what's really neat is the editor that we wrote didn't have New Line as a character, so you can't delete a New Line to make that happen. There was some bug operation of our own editor that ended up dropping the New Line there, putting the two lines together. Um, and Christian informed us that the result of this is, is it's, it's doing horizontal explosions, it's trying to do lots of them, but um, because the instruction's not there, it only allows you to do one horizontal at a time. Since they go so fast, nobody ever noticed. So that's, that's it. And then Christian comes to Chicago for his job interview, and, and he's showing me what Eugene just showed you. And he's totally analyzed the diagonal explosion routine, which is 12 pages. It is, it is a big, hairy routine. And this is kind of what his work looks like on it. Most of it's in French, his native language. It's his only language. He, he um, brought his partner and was a translator for him when he was with us. And Christian lives in the San Francisco area now. And I sent him an email and was hoping he was coming. You're not here, are you? Christian? Okay, Ryan? Is, is Christian chasing Pokemon? Okay. And this is... The, what? He's fixing the source code. Oh, yes, he is. Yes, he is. Actually, he, he found where's Waldo. <laughs> Anyhow, um, this is the page where the bug was, and he's very, very <coughs> carefully going through it. And when, it, when you get to the end of the line, the, the fix for the bug is putting in these two instructions, which if this thing hits zero that you're decrementing, then you want to get the hell out of there and not do what's going to crash the program. Same applies there, and it was it was an index jump, not a that wasn't an explosion. It was an index jump, and if you indexed off of zero instead of hitting a, a address to jump to, you hit some numbers that didn't mean anything, and the program went to space. So I learned that this week. You always can learn about your projects. Um, now, if we were had the development system and all the software together, we would have just put those two instructions in there, run the assembler, run the linker, make the EEPROMs, here's your new version. This was 1986, we didn't have the computers, we didn't have the code, we didn't have anything. And so instead of doing that, what you do is a series of patches, which Christian wrote, and you take where, where the first problem is, and you just overwrite an instruction to, uh, if we say, jump to somewhere. So the control comes to where the problem is, you jump to somewhere in a, an empty block of memory, and there weren't many empty blocks, but there was enough. And he, of course, was French-speaking, so it's, his patches are on de and toi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he, put his, he put his initials and the, um, and the date in there, which is uh, 5 of 87. And we made, I, I worked to then take, and we had checksums, and we had booby traps in there, and these two bytes fix those so that everything works right. And we made a new ROM 5, and we gave it, I gave it to people, and it, it got a ROM. People had it, but it wasn't really widely distributed, and most Robotrons still crash when you do that. Um, so here's Christian um, with us at Williams, that's outside the front door. That was the listing of the program at the time that we were, you know, going through and comparing. And uh, that's Michelle, that is um, Christian's partner, who came with him. And he's holding, those are the prototype boards for the Blitter, the graphics pro coprocessor, that kind of is a souvenir. We're like, here, take these party <laughs> gifts and a box of rice and and thank you. <laughs> And uh, this is, you know, this is the room where it happened. This is my apartment, the second bedroom, which we developed Stargate in that I have no pictures of. But Christian and Eugene played some Robotron in there where it got filled with games. Once we moved to Halstead Street, my second bedroom got filled with games. And uh, here's a picture of uh, Eugene and Christian with Ken Fidesna, another one of the very, very key players to the Williams and Midway dynasty. Um, he was there working with us. He was the leader of the Defender team. That yeah, was a Skunk Works project that he you hired, took. Did you hire him? He hired me. No, did you hire Hired Christian. 
No, he, um, he had a, there was immigration, and he was finished in college, and, and I got, I, for the late wrap-up show, I've got the seven letters in their entirety, and we can go through them. Um, but so it, it kind of tells the whole story. I didn't even know I had these until I started scouring for this. And I've got, there were six or seven letters back and forth over a time period where um, he was going back to college, and he was worried about immigration, and, um, and then we didn't hear from him for a long time, and then I found him on Facebook. Scott <laughs> Van Um so back to Ken Fidesna, he is um, he's the second human superman at, at human interaction and, and recognizing talent, dealing with talent, solving people's problems. And